Let's move on to part two of the video. Why is China in such rush to get this blockchain up and running? Because every single grand solar minimum through history, their emperors have fallen because of uprisings due to food shortages. And this time it's going to be no different. They can't stop the weather globally. And if you're unfamiliar with what a grand solar minimum is, it's when our sun goes into a lower state of activity and it's output electrically and magnetically. This, because it's connected directly to our Earth on these magnetic field lines and these field aligned currents has drastic effects on our weather patterns, as well as volcanism, tectonic movement, earthquakes, and you get this whole gamut of effects along with each one of these grand solar minimums. Let's go back a thousand years in time and we'll take a look at some of the minimums here. Dalton minimum was the one in the 1800s. Maunder minimum, late 1600s to 17. We got the Sporer minimum, the Wolf minimum, going back in time to the Oort minimum around 1050. And the Chinese are very familiar with what happened with their dynastic collapses during each of these. Now there's so much information out there and the IPCC keeps pushing over that it's CO2. But when we look back in history, you can see that the areas on our planet have warmed and cooled. Look at the Arctic over the last 2000 years. It has warmed and cooled long before humans had put any CO2 from burning coal or anything. Even Let's even go back to the earliest of the 1700s when we were getting steam up and running. Even if you want to go back that far and say that there was input into the atmosphere from producing something from a steam engine. Okay. And you can see again through each regional area, whether it be the Arctic, Europe, Asia, North America, Australia, Asia, which includes New Zealand, Australia, islands down there, South America, Antarctica. Look how warm it was 1200 years ago in Antarctica. It's actually cooled since that time. And all the while IPCC keeps screaming, it's CO2, it's CO2, you're making the planet warmer. So let's look at some of the forecasts going out. The minimum that we are going into right now, and this is why the weather is so mixed up and so strange and getting more intensely mixed up as we move forward month to month, is because we're dropping back into another modern minimum, if not something even stronger on a longer cyclical, more powerful pattern. At the least, we are going into a modern minimum type cooling which would not have seen any types of weather like this for over 400 years. And Dr. Abutamatov at the Pukovo Astronomical Observatory in Russia, same forecast. The Russians are ahead of this. They have been putting out forecast upon forecast. And if we look at the heartbeat of the sun from the principal component analysis, this is all about magnetic canceling waves on the sun. Russian scientists, Zarkova, Zarkov, Popov, and Shepard. This maps out prior cycles, and you can see clearly where we are dropping down into. Let me wide out on that a little bit for you. We are taking a step down from this black circle into something that will be very similar to the 1600s modern minimum starting right now. And it is going to be a quick and drastic step down. We're going to descend down into something that would be the equivalent of temperatures in the 1600s within the next eight years. The forecast is right here for you. Now, when we take a look at different periods of time on the exit and entry into these grand solar minimums, the above chart runs over 200 years of time from 1550 to 1750. The bottom chart covers 400 years, a little bit longer time frame. But the entry into this grand solar minimum is much, much faster than it was back in the early 1600s, which gave them a little more time to adapt to the changing conditions in agriculture and wherever you look, whether it be sunspot, areas on the solar rotation, down. And you can understand why China is pushing for this digitization of assets. This will include your food supply. Absolutely. This thing, I believe, is made for food supply. They're running it as a test, if you will, for tea, so it doesn't seem too obtrusive and scary. If I tell you I'm going to come in and take your wheat supply and I'm going to digitize it, how would you feel about that? T, that doesn't scare you. So I made this chart myself. I overlaid the collapse of Chinese dynasties on top of the grand solar minimums. And you can pretty clearly see that even the Mongol invasions were spurred on and started due to some 
feedback loop inside a Grand Solar Minimum that forced them to go look to different areas for food. Yuan Dynasty collapses, and then Zhongha is out on explorations when they thought the next Grand Solar Minimum was commencing in the early 1400s. And then we got the Ming Dynasty collapsing, and then we also have the Qing Dai, the Qing Dynasty, and the problems associated with that and the Great Famines. So when you start to take a look at the expected temperature drop by continent during these Grand Solar Minimums, you can see Northern Asia pushing down into that Heilongjiang and the Neimonggu and the Monggu area. Of course, it's going to be dropping in temperature. There's going to be loss of food production. That's Heilongjiang is the northern area and Inner Mongolia, Mongolia. This was the modern minimum changes. But when you look at the temperature change drops on the areas on our planet with that really dark blue where we grow our crops right now, specifically wheat, anywhere it's dark blue, that's a total loss. It's not going to be plantable, harvestable, or growable during these next 15 years. So we look out at the solar activity forecast for cycle 25 and 26. The intensification should increase with the decrease in the solar output. So if we are going to look and really see if this is happening, okay, IPCC says everything's warming and there's going to be feedback loops. All right, Greenland this year set the July temperature for the coldest reported temperature ever in the Northern Hemisphere in July at minus 33 degrees Celsius. Now, last year they also hit that same mark for minus 31 degrees Celsius. So what are the chances that two years in a row they break their own record for the coldest temperature ever recorded in central Greenland at Summon Station? Also this year, mass budget increasing record ice, which nobody really talks about. They always like to talk about how the periphery is melting. They never talk about the ice budget itself. It's always got to be melting. Well, why discount and not talk about and sweep under the rug the record ice growth this year that completely bucks any of the patterns that the IPCC is claiming. And Dr. Roy Spencer's site here, taking a look at the UAH temperatures, we're only at 0.21 above baseline. Hey, I thought we were going to warm to like 2 degrees Celsius or something. That's 10 times lower than the IPCC said. And if we look year upon year, 2016 in the blue box compared to 2017, and these are by global, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, and the tropics. You can see the temperature is dropping in certain areas of the planet. Also, another anomalous fact they don't put in the newspapers often. 1971 sea ice is eclipsed by 2017 sea ice. But they'll rattle off into something about, well, it's a thickness. It's not the actual coverage. But wait a second. Two years ago, they were just talking about the coverage. And now it's the thickness because coverage overtakes and now they have to make new excuses why. Let's look on some longer time scales here. We say the same thing again, just in a different form from different researchers put in that shows prior different areas of the globe were cooler or warmer than they are today. So I like to look at cycles. I like numbers. Longer term cycles, we got the Gleisberg cycle, we got the 102 year maximum cycle. And then what's funny is when you stack on top of each other, you get John Casey's RC cycle. Then when we put five of those 205-year cycles together, we get one eddy cycle at, we get an eddy cycle at 1,025 years. And then you multiply that by five again, and we come to 5,125. Gee, where have I seen that number before? Those are the ancient traditions that we talk about. And now we're talking about stacking fives up to 25,650, up to 100,000 in the glaciation cycles. There's more powerful cycles at work here. And if you like stacking numbers and running them out, why don't we talk about planetary geometry and falls in temperature? Let's go further back in time. Chinese Wei Dynasty collapsed 580 AD. This is a late antique little ice age. So China's understanding and historical records are vast. They have thousands of years of climate data. They know what's coming again. That's why they are trying to put everything into a digital format so it can be moved with their new currency that they're going to control. And they're also going to control the entire platform around it. Let's look at the planetary geometry here. When you get into that parallel set of the Jovians and the Earth all on the same side, 578 AD is a good example. And 2024, we're getting right into the same planetary geometry. So let's take a look here a little bit closer in so you can see it. 
Now, if you're not familiar with the outer planets, they're also termed as the Jovians. And when they go in these parallel sets and the Earth is sandwiched between, orbits slightly pulled out. And when this happens, there's different effects magnetically coupling with the sun, which also has these changes in our jet streams. And this is what affects all the crop production. And then if we jump back another 500 years, we find a similar pattern in 79 AD, which we're going to repeat here in 2024. And if you don't like visuals, okay, let's move over into a graph where they actually plotted these Jovians. And you can see clearly that it's a repeating pattern that's measurable. Top line, Maunder minimum. Middle line, Dalton minimum. Bottom line, green arrow, our current time frame. We are entering a grand solar minimum. Now, when we look back at historical droughts during these same times, Let's focus on Asia. Where would you not be able to grow crops from 1636 to 1641? The same area in Heilongjiang that's about to experience cold. Not only are they going to experience cold, but they're going to experience drought on top as well. And then suddenly the light bulb goes on. And North Korea is revamping its agriculture right now, isn't it? Oh yeah, they must see the same thing. Repeating cycles in history. Moving back to China. Warm weather crops such as oranges were abandoned in Jiangxi province where they grew for centuries. But the grand solar minimum made it so cold and so wet that they had to abandon growing oranges there. Pakistan became cooler. Mass migrations at that time out of the Indus Valley. Punjab as well. We are repeating cycles. You can expect the exact same thing happened again. Let's look at longer cycles. This is John Casey's 206 year RC. And we can see smaller cycles coupled within that on the Gleisberg cycles. And within that, there's also a 50 year cycle. So we have cycles laying on top of cycles on top of cycles. But when it comes down to the magnetic electrical effects from the sun coupling with the earth, changing our jet streams, this is how the intertropical convergent zone displaces during these grand solar minimums. So literally the flow of water across the planet is going to be disrupted and moved into different places. Have you noticed how many floods there are in these last few years that are the 100 year flood, the 1000 year flood, the 500 year flood, and then there's droughts in some areas that are just unprecedented. That's because the rain belts are shifting across the planet, which they have before. These cloud belts move. Atmospheric circulation moves. The polar high is not a polar high anymore. That's why you get these Arctic tongues coming down. What do they call them? Polar vortexes. Everything you see on this schematic is outdated. This new grand solar minimum is going to skew this so badly that we're going to get into something like this as our regular pattern. Where you're going to get these locking highs that force everything else down and out of place. And when you look at tropical rainfall over the last two millennia, you start to see the same thing. These undulations around China, specifically where it became wetter and drier. Hence, their agriculture is going to be affected. But they are one of the major importers on this planet. Now, without enough food to feed their people, there's going to be riots in the street. There's already such a disparage between the haves and the have-nots due to the economic boom over the last 20 years. There's a division in society. It's just barely under the surface. And the only reason it's kept in check is because the hard hand with that military and the government keeping that in check. Hard hitting stick mentality is lifted off of there. Watch that place explode. And they're not going to be able to maintain control of food prices rise. And even the well to do and middle class are just gouged by food prices. That's going to double or triple and then take all that money out of the disposable economy there as well. And you'll start to see why they want to control food and digitize everything. South America during the grand solar minimums, not immune either. But for those of you who believe in CO2 warming, I would like to point out that the medieval warming period was warmer than today's temperatures. We are out of time. We have lost decades to prepare by this myth of CO2 that's been pushed for so long. But now there's so much counter information coming out showing you the truth that it's becoming a tidal wave now. By next year, grand solar minimum is going to be a lexicon used through search engines across this planet that will eclipse anything CO2-based warming. 
2019 for sure, you're going to have kindergarten kids going grand solar minimum, guaranteed. Now, another in the feedback loop is cosmic ray density increases. It's been proven time and time again through CERN and also Heinrich Spensmark, the pioneer in this field of study. The Cloud Mystery, available free on YouTube. I highly encourage you to watch this. It will explain everything in such easy to understand terms. You'll understand how cosmic rays form more clouds. And if we take a look at solar cycle 24 compared with the last 150 years of cycles, it is at the lowest, which would be also the inverse. The galactic cosmic rays are increasing to the highest. And when we overlay these two, there's a direct inverse relationship between the two. And as we enter this grand solar minimum, we are going to eclipse this by such a great magnitude. Our magnetosphere is directly connected to the sun. And as the sun decreases in its power output state magnetically and electrical coupling with our earth, and the field line currents that power this whole system, we're going to step down as well. These patterns of shift within our atmosphere, these out of season storms are going to be the norm. And with the decrease in the solar wind pressure, there's just so many effects on our planet. This explains everything, not CO2. Then the forecast for cloud formation and galactic cosmic rays is 19% higher than the last solar cycle. New England already at plus 19%. This is just going to keep increasing and increasing in the amount of cloud cover and strange storms and thousand-year floods. And I'm waiting for this winter. There is going to be some place where it dumps out an atmospheric compression event blizzard. That is going to bury a town in 15 feet of snow. No kidding. There's going to be one of these events that is going to bury a town. This is the type of precipitation that's going to be ringing out of the atmosphere. And now the scientists are not so afraid to speak out as they were 10 years ago with the IPCC's witch hunts going on. So the CMIP-6 run on a deep maximum. Look at the galactic cosmic ray increases. That is startling. That should scare you when you see this chart. That is so much cloud cover that that it alone could drop global temperatures. And the amount of rainfall coming out of there would wipe out our crops. Systems for drainage are not going to be able to handle this. Now, if it is electromagnetic interaction of our sun on the planet and not CO2, we should start to see the same effects happening to other planets as well, where there's no cars or factories up there. Neptune, look at the energetic exchange happening. This is the same thing. They're talking about more ferocious and fierce storms. What do you think is happening on Neptune? Let's look at all the Jovians here. Saturn on the left. Look at the poles. Look at Jupiter. Neptune and Uranus, they're all electrically different right now. This is what's happening to our Earth as well. Do you think they're not also experiencing strange weather on these other planets? That's completely out of sync. And then we come back to our own Earth here. Now we're starting to see electrical phenomenon in the sky as there tried to be an equalization between polarization charges Red jellyfish sprites, which used to be rare, now being captured regularly by amateur photographers. And we should start to see more and more of these increasing as well in intensity and brightness and length of duration. Which brings us right back into the Thunderbolts. They were predicting we would start to see stuff like this and symbols of an ancient sky that... What they talked about in myth and legend and what has been left in stone carvings and stele and all these temple motifs about thunderbolts and gods in the sky and lightning bolts and lightning bolt arrows and all these things, plasma. They predicted we would start to see the same thing again as we entered into a lessened state of solar activity. And what did we get over Australia last month? The exact same things that we start to see in Assyrian as well as Indian temple reliefs. Steve, a new type of proton arc never discovered or seen before. Not only was it seen once, it was seen twice this year, a month apart. So this is a visualization of the canceling waves on the sun, which are going to usher in this grand solar minimum. Over in cycle 25 and 26, you see how they're opposite and they're canceling each other. Let's just go back in shorter duration, 40 years of time. The last solar cycle comparison, our solar cycle 24, far below anything else in that time frame. 
What about this 50-year cycle? Double typhoons just passed over Taiwan two weeks ago. Nisad and Haitang. When's the last time that occurred? 1967. So you can expect to see a repeat of 1967 weather at the bare minimum wherever you live. Look for climate information for 1967 in, lo in your local area. And I'm pretty sure that you're going to repeat something like that, but a little more intense because these cycles are overlapping on top of each other. We got the 50 and the minimum, the 206 year overlapping right now. And I'm going to say also the eddies on top of that with a thousand year cyclical. And Maurice Cottrell's 3,740 year cycle, I say we're getting a blend of all four on top of each other on this more powerful coupling of cycles. And it all comes back to the food. If you don't eat, you want regime change. If you don't eat, you become angry and unpredictable. If you don't eat, you have nothing left to lose. And desperate people do desperate things. Hard winter red down to 743 million bushels from 1 billion bushels. That's a 298 million bushel difference. That's 25% less. And then the Kansas winter wheat was wiped out through that late season blizzard. That's a 35% decrease minimum on the Kansas wheat. But remember, since it was so stressed, the protein content is not going to be the same. So it might take 1.2 tons to equal the same protein amount in what was previously one ton of wheat. So don't to say it's one ton any longer. The stress on the plants going from hot to cold and out of season blizzards and ice, and then they try to regrow after that. In this maturation process, those seeds are smaller and they're very different in the amount of nutrition content. USDA putting wheat plantings smallest since 1919 as farmers try to switch to other crops. And then we're getting frozen corn in the fields. June 27th, frozen solid corn, and then this is what it looks like in a lot of areas. Now granted, some areas are thriving with plentiful rainfall, but there's so many areas that are in drought. Also in Canada, they stranded over a million tons of canola in the fields. Now I wanted to get back into the feedback loop also with the cosmic rays. There seem to be some correlation of volcanic eruptions during many ice ages or grand solar minimums. 1258, that was the Southern Song that finished at that time, the Jin Dynasty as well, around 1200. 1450, that's where they sent out Zhenghua to look for other alternative trade because they thought another grand solar minimum was starting because the Yuan Dynasty was just re-emerging after their collapse from drought in 1380. Then we get into the year without a summer, and you got the Ming Dynasty collapse around 1600. There's just more volcanic ash in the air that's also coupling with cloud cover. And that albedo effect is tremendous. Now think about this. The year without a summer, this is the Dalton minimum. That Tambora eruption cooled Europe this much that their crops were wiped out. And you know for sure around Asia the same thing happened. I mean, that eruption took place in Asia. And then South America also was very discernible in the amount of lost production from the single eruption. And then case in point, the Pinatubo eruption, that was in the Philippines in the 1990s. That single eruption cooled North America, parts of Asia, and parts of Europe up to 2C off a single one eruption. Now what happens when we get something that's more powerful? A VEI-7 versus a VEI-6, the amount of ash going in the atmosphere on a Tambora-style eruption, and the most important point to get to with this intertropical convergence zone shift, I want you to notice where the low GCR flux is compared to the high GCR and how this moves south. This is going to draw the moisture with it, drying out areas north of that red line. Let's look here. The forecast is everything 45 north and above is going to go completely offline. So this is going to take out all of Heilongjiang, Parts of Inner Mongolia, North Korea is going to be ruined. And then we just need to go around the world. Most, if not all, of Canada and anything in the Dakotas growing areas in the periphery. Then we take a look over into Europe and Russia is going to have a very difficult time in the Ural Mountains areas, Kazakhstan. But think about all of these areas going offline. What is it going to do to the global commodities prices? Food's going to be unavailable in some areas. There were global famines in the 1600s. There were global famines in the 1300s. 10% of the world's population 
died of disease and starvation in the 1800s during the Dalton Minimum. Chinese dynasties collapse every single time one of these rolls around. So they are absolutely trying to protect themselves this time. But here's the timeline going out for you. How fast does this need to occur, the transition to digital currency? Well, we already looked at this one slide here of how fast we're going to descend into the mini ice age. Let's break it apart here and show the amplification between years stepping forward into time. Now, everything needs to be set and in place before 2021. After that point, if the cryptocurrency economy is not set, it never will be. There's a race against the clock and a race against amplification and race against food price increases to get everything set. So as we move in to 2016 and 17, you've already seen an enormous amount of amplification and weather effects. 2017 to 18, it's been a ramp up. And you have noticed absolutely there's been a ramp up in strangeness, specifically vortices events, spinning winds, tornadoes, wind in general, and rain Downburst, sideburst, whatever you like to call it, there's been an amplification. That's nothing compared to what's coming over the 2018 and 19 amplification. It's going to be a four times amplification over these last two years. And then it's going to amplify again as we go from 2019 to 2020. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is cryptocurrency market capitalizations locking step for step with the increases in the amplification of the grand solar minimum weather patterns. So all that change we've seen from 2016-17 is the ramp up in cryptocurrency going from $5 for Ether all the way up to $400 and then Bitcoin, you know, around $1,000 going up to $4,000 and it's just seen it time and time again, everything exploding. Keeping pace moving into the end of 2017 into 2018, there's going to be an incredible increase in market cap for cryptocurrency. I'm putting my forecast out around $400 billion by 2018. And as we get into 2018 and 19, that's going to ramp up four or five times that. But as more people get on board, there could be an exponential increase that I'm not factoring in. But what I am factoring in is spot returns on La Nina. Now, if you think La Nina, that is going to be a baby push in weather compared to what's about to happen. So when we start to look at the global crops that are most affected during cooler weather periods... Wheat is one of those. So you would expect wheat to start rising in price right away. Soybeans as well. And isn't it interesting how China bought almost the entire U.S. soybean crop for 2017 to import back to China this year? Now, I wonder if they're going to digitize that and store it in warehouses inside China because at the rate they're going off the AC chain, that's exactly what I would do is every time I get grain, lumber, or whatever it is that's in access sitting around in China that they're not able to sell on the market, and there's a glut of a lot of stuff, why not digitize it and let everybody take ownership of it? So when it increases in price later on, people will be able to use the increase in that to then restart the economy again in the local area or the country that's issuing that coin or the token. When we talk about rising food prices, those of you who lived through 2008 and 9, which we all did, we saw that massive run up in oil prices, we saw the massive run up in everything prices, Silver, gold, grains, you name it, it was up and then it crashed. Food prices. People pulled out of their disposable spending because fuel cost more money at that time, as well as everything else. The spending habits changed a lot. Local businesses suffered, and this is nothing, I mean nothing to what's coming, because in 2008 and 9, you could shift spending habits. You could carpool with people, you could drive less, you could work from home, you could do a lot of other things to try to minimize expenses based on passed down costs on rising fuel prices. But this time, it's different. It's based on food price increases and yield decreases in the grand solar minimum. Everybody eats every day. There's no way to escape at this time. There's no way to shift your spending pattern away from food. This is absolutely going to pull out of the economy and this is what's going to collapse at this time. When food doubles or triples in price, there's no way the economy can survive. All that extra money that would be spent out in the economy is re-diverted into food. Also another prediction, by 2020, America will have totally done away with all these mandated ethanol fuels because we look at it, question, food or fuel. Riots on the streets, people protesting every day, severe social unrest based on food prices, 
you're not going to be diverting that over into the gas tank. They're going to try to get every farmer to use every single square inch of arable land within the United States to try to feed its citizens. And so will every other country. But they're going to have to battle with the changing weather patterns, the out-of-season storms that are going to decimate crops, cold weather when it should be warm. It's going to be just a difficult time keeping up any types of yield coming out of our traditional grow zones. Hence, the underlying assets. If the global economy has crashed and the fiat currency is no longer accepted or believed in and the entire confidence is gone out of that system, are you really going to send your 60,000 tons of wheat over in a ship to another country on an LC through a sketchy bank that may or may not pay you? I guarantee you will not. You're going to move over into a smart contract where that money's locked in before that thing leaves port. And if you think hyperinflation can't happen anywhere in the world, it can and it will. And the only way to protect yourself, it won't matter if that's a U.S. dollar, if your underlying assets, either a Bitcoin or Ethereum or Ethereum Classic or Monero or whatever it is, Dash or Dogecoin, I don't care what you're holding. That paper money is meaningless to you because your value is stored in a different asset that's tradable. So why would you even look at the dollar value of it? Because it doesn't have anything to do with dollars anymore. It'll be a tradable asset amongst peers in its own ecosystem of value. Let's go back to 2008 and nine for a moment. Average spending on the left side, US consumers were pushing about $110 a day. After the crash, they were pushing less than 60. So moving out, let's say the average spending 60 today because I know the economy has not recovered as reported in the media across most of the globe. So we'll put, we'll peg it at 60 bucks. Now, if you drop another 50 off of that, you're telling me the average daily spending for Americans is gonna be $10? So my question is truly, the whole video is focusing on when will these grain harvests start to be digitized and move through smart contracts? And as I see it, there will be an asset class for every investor with an ICO token coin for every size of deliverable agricultural commodity from this 60 kg bag here to the barge size and what about multiple barges and the 60,000 ton break bark vessels each one of these cargo capacity will have a different coin associated with its volume and whether it be corn or soy or oats or millet or sorghum or cooking oils or whatever it is you see the future. And when I really wasn't joking when I was talking about there's probably going to be a 2019 USA wheat coin created to digitize part of the 2019 harvest. It's going to come that fast. Thanks for watching. Hope you got something out of the video. Our lives are going to be so drastically different, so very, very different from this point forward. I hope you can adapt to change because that's all it's going to be from this point forward is changing nonstop continuous, metamorphic, ground-shaking, inconceivable changes, and you're going to have to roll with it. And I hope this gives you a head start of where it's going so you can position yourself correctly to benefit off this. You should be thriving during this time. You should not be a pauper at the end of this time. With this information that you just watched this video, you need to be coming out of the backside of this a multimillionaire and helping others along the way too. That's the whole point. Just don't go in at all greedy and try to get as much as you can and leave everybody in the dust. Bring people along with you. Help people along the way. There's going to be a lot of mental breakdowns during this time. There's going to be such a high suicide rate during this time. You need to explain to people what's going on, that it cycles in the sun. Not to worry about their wealth. There's other ways to preserve wealth. And not to worry about the food. You can grow your own food. You can work with your community. You know it's coming, so you can start to prepare right now in advance for all these changes. And on a last note, with the world in such disarray right now economically, and you can see governments spending so carelessly and recklessly, and you look at it and go, they're using no common sense. It's impossible what they're doing. How do they expect to pay anything back? They never will. They won't. They don't intend to. And all your retirement savings that's locked up into this system is absolutely going to vanish. And speaking of those using digital platforms, thank you so much, Daniel, Kristen, and Tom, for your contributions through paypal.me slash adapt2030. I've also listed my cryptocurrency deposit addresses below. So if you feel you found this video informative in some way that can help you benefit through the future, please consider Patreon or a cryptocurrency deposit.